Good afternoon, everybody. A warm welcome. My name is Erin Balhartz, and we are here together to talk about urban air mobility and talk about the future of aviation, a topic which is very, very dear to all of our hearts at the moment. And um, this talk today, one that I'm very excited about, is going to be um, a look into the future and a look into a future which is not as grim as what we've been hearing in the classic aviation industry um, in these troubled times. This is a look into the very bright future, um, a very Jetsons future um, of urban air mobility. And we are talking today with some of the world's experts um, who are really pushing this industry forward. And we are talking today to um, people who are really uh, dedicated their life's work to getting these um, different types of flying cars, uh, flying drones, um, cargo drones up into the air um, from a perspective of government regulation, from a perspective of how is this all going to work, commercial applications, as well as business. Um, so today we are very, very excited to, to welcome um, our five guests from some of these leading companies and institutions. Um, and I would also like to recognize uh, we have a wonderful group of participants listening today. Um, and just to give you an idea of what we have um, on this event from a participants list, I just had the list um up before from this morning so we have people coming and joining us professors from universities we have uh, 10 different government organizations from all around the world joining today 13 different airlines and counting um eight plus different tech companies we have uh, at least four members of the press we have different um, players in the uam industry we have um aircraft manufacturers. We have a trend agency here today, three from automotive, um, two or three from medical transport, as well as um, regular people who are interested. And um, of course, one group that we represent at Lufthansa Systems is the vendors to the airline industry and aviation industry. So a warm welcome to everybody today. And um, let's get started. Um, we have um, over 300 live viewers um, and let's go now to the, uh, the first slide. We have a little bit of housekeeping to do. Thank you. Um, we also have a production team in the background that I would like to say a great big thanks to because this has been a little bit difficult from a, a, a technological perspective to get this event working properly. So um, please uh, let's all cross our fingers for, for a perfect event with no technical problems, which is also something with these new um, online get togethers, which we're always having to fight with. Um, with regards to housekeeping today, we have um, a five expert panel. Um, each of the experts is going to be talking for about uh, 20 minutes um, and introducing what they are doing in this area of urban air mobility, of um, eVTOL technology, um, future cities and future airspace concepts within the, um, the context of um, airspace over cities. Um, and then finally, we're going to top it off with a Q&A session. Any time during the um, event today, you may, as a um, participant, there is a Q&A function, which is a little chat tab with a question mark in it. You can open that up and ask your questions. You can make them general to the whole uh, group. You can ask um, specific speakers anything and we will collect all of the questions and use them during the Q&A and maybe I can pepper some in between the speakers while we're getting the other things loaded. Um, the chat will be um, 
The chat will not be um, shared or recorded due to data protection laws. We are in Germany right now, um, but the entire video will be available to view after the fact, and we will be posting that on LinkedIn and maybe making little snippets. So um, that will be available for you, and you can share and uh, use that later on. What else? Um, yeah. Whatever you would like to ask over the time also to me or have, if you have any questions for Lufthansa systems, then let us know. Um, could you next slide, please? So why are we um, here today as Lufthansa systems? Um, we are a classical IT vendor uh, to the airline and aviation industry for the past 25 years, and we have a lot of expertise in um, flight ops and ground ops and predictive maintenance and the entire um, airspace charting. So for us, uh, with our expertise, we are trying to bridge classical aviation knowledge with um, the future, which all of our speakers are doing today. Um, and we hope that we can also give over the next set of events that we're doing as part of a series that we can give um, some of our classical knowledge and transfer some of this knowledge to accelerate the, um, the eVTOL and uh, urban air mobility uh, area. So um, without further ado, I would like to introduce our speakers. And these are the these are the people who have drawn such a, an incredible audience for us today. So we have first up Colin Chung from Lufthansa Innovation Hub. And Colin is experienced research and intelligence analyst in travel and mobility tech. Um, he is looking after the future of mobility topics um, and what he calls the new transport economy. So coming from a data-driven perspective, Colin is going to give us a, an overview of the whole industry, also with very commercial applications of how this is all going to look in the future. So welcome, Colin. Thank you for being here. Next, we have Volker Golnick. And he is uh, from the German Aerospace Center, DLR in German. Um, and Professor Golnick is, um, has a PhD in aerospace engineering and a very, very long history in this industry with um, different roles at Airbus Helicopters, EADS, uh, German Aerospace Center, um, the German Forces, and he's had major cooperations with Lufthansa, different companies with Airbus, Rode and Schwartz, Deal Aerospace and NASA. Um, Next up, we have Florian Adolf from Volocopter. Good morning, Florian. Good afternoon, Florian, sorry. Um, having commuted a lot, Florian is a genuine aviation buff, and um, he says an aviation guy. He has 17 years of hands-on experience doing um, autonomous aviation solutions from a technology perspective and a robotics perspective. So he is joining us from Volocopter and um, has a, a very impressive background and a lot of um, uh, experience to share as well from his previous role at the German Aerospace Center. Then we have Felix Lee from Ehang joining us. Hi, Felix. Um, and Felix is the Overseas Managing Director at Ehang, which is um, a intelligent aerial vehicle company, basically a drone taxi supplier, um, and developing different types of drones for things like uh, firefighting in Chinese high rises at the moment and other tests which we would like to hear about. And so looking forward to that. Hi. And then we have also Rohit Goyal calling from Uber, the Elevate product, um, project, and he is a strategy leader and an engineer at Uber Elevate. And he has worked um, with Bruce Allen Hamilton, concentrating on urban air mobility pro projects, as well as with the FAA and NASA. So, master's in engineering from Harvard University uh, with a specialization in aeronautics and astronautics from MIT. Um, 
A lot of education here, a lot of experience. I have skimmed over it very, very briefly for time because uh, your resumes are all awesome. So I would like to then um, get going and let you talk. And I would hand over now to Colin from Lufthansa Innovation Hub. Colin, the stage is yours. Yeah. Hey everyone, uh, first of all, a warm welcome to uh, my today's introductory presentation. Um, it's amazing to see so many participants um, and it's also an honor to be invited to today's uh, session. So thanks for the invitation. Yeah, my name is Colin and um, I will guide you through my presentation, which I termed uh, the race for the big bucks, which will be a quick and short introduction on the investment side um, in the air taxi space. So while the race of developing flying cars has started to gain momentum in uh, recent years, the concept has been around for decades, uh, which you probably know. And one of the earliest attempts at a flying car was by, by Glenn Curtis back in 1917, um, which he, he wrote down and um, fired as a patent application, but obviously um, his idea and his invention never took off. And then several um, serious attempts, um, such as the 1947 Conf, Confair car, which is illustrated uh, on the slide, to introduce flying cars to mainstream uh, America were made. But um, many of those attempts, or actually all of them, um, over the last centuries um, have failed to reach commercial success. And so the question is, uh, what's different today? And what we see today is that, uh, that the recent technological developments in the drone, but also the e-mobility industry, paired with uh, the rise of multiple global challenges, such as urbanization, but also um, the sustainability pressure, have moved air taxis from mere science fiction to uh, closer to reality, um, which could become one solution to address for example, the challenge of um, urbanization. And, um, and this could be as early as in the next couple of years, as, as some air taxi starts, uh, startups have already announced, such as uh, Lilium and also Holocopter. And we from the Lufthansa Innovation Hub believe that in order to navigate through this new space, we need a data-driven view in order to provide um, yeah, the community with more clarity on where we are heading towards and to bring also a more substantiated view to the yeah, mostly opinionated debate. Before I'm jumping into, the, into my presentation, I would quickly also like to introduce the Lufthansa Innovation Hub to you. Um, the Lufthansa Innovation Hub is the main digital innovation unit of the Lufthansa Group. Uh, we are based in the capital city of Berlin, uh, founded in um, 2014, with satellite offices in uh, Singapore and soon to be also in uh, Shanghai. We connect our parent company with the overall travel and mobility tech ecosystem, how we term it. And our mission overall is to create and also capture value beyond flying. And to do this, we invest in uh, startups, initiate partnerships between Lufthansa and uh, digital challengers, and uh, most importantly, incubate new digital businesses uh, ourselves. And in our work, we, we always follow the, the credo data beats opinion. So we want to act on facts rather than beliefs or opinions. And that's also why we um, explore and analyze the overall travel and mobility tech e um, ecosystem which is um, the crucial foundation on which all of the Lufthansa Innovation Hub's activities are actually built on. So to get going, um, let's take a brief look at the overall air taxi uh, ecosystem. And uh, as a heads up, this obviously is non-exhaustive, so this is just uh, a selection of, of, um, of some companies. So what we see, we see currently more than 170 initiatives uh, for making the vision of a flying car a reality. And we, we obviously also experience, um, experience a strong engagement by uh, aerospace companies, um, but also from the automotive industry, as well as players from the tech um, um, scene. So it's a, it's a very broad, um, um, broad um, spectrum of companies entering that kind of space. 
And my intention today is to put some more realism into the conversation from an investment point of view about specifically all the ideas, so focusing more on the startup side uh, that are floating um, around. In general, what we experience is a very strong growth of capital um, flowing into air taxi startups. And that's obviously um, a good sign for the rather nascent um, industry. So up to mid-October uh, this year, more than um, 1 billion uh, US dollars have been already invested globally into, the air in, into air taxi startups. And uh, now sit tight, um, this is more than the last 10 years combined. So there's a lot of dynamic behind it. Um, most of the capital, and that's also the truth, um, this year was invested into only two startups. That's namely Joby Aviation and uh, Lilium. One located in California and the other one um, located in Germany. And both of them became so-called unicorns. Um, and unicorn, it's, it's a definition in, um, in the startup world where the fund adventure exceeds uh, the one billion uh, in valuation. So as previously mentioned, um, most funding went into Joby and Lilium, which is also visualized on uh, this slide. Uh, various the other players are left far behind, as you can see. And um, in general, the perceived impression in, in previous months, uh, maybe even years, was that um, there was a lot of excitement and confidence with money flowing into these startups. Um, and these startups, on the other hand, claim to be making lots of money in the uh, yeah, lots of money in the future, so, and completely change the way we commute from A to B. Um, but at some point you arrive at what I would call reality, um, especially if you look at the figures. Um, the dozens of initiatives out there, I previously mentioned more than 170, need to prove that they have a chance of generating revenue in the foreseeable future. Um, otherwise, um, they won't be able to convince investors, um, especially from, from the VC side. Um, and as research publications from multiple recognized firms outline startups in this vertical need at least 700 to about 1 billion US dollars for development, certification, manufacturing and go to market, uh, which does not include mass industrialization. And as most of you probably know, certification can be, can be quite a costly and, and lengthy process. And during the time the company burns cash week after week without generating any kind of, of revenue. Hence, the question that arises is, where will the billions of capital come from? And this also applies for the already well-funded startups, such as like Joby Aviation, um, as they most likely need, need follow-on fund, uh, funding in the future. But another interesting observation is uh, when you look at those startups, um, Joby, Lilium, Vodocopter, but also other startups, um, that they have the ambition to claim every piece of the cake, so to, so to speak, and control the uh, entire supply chain. And what I mean by this is that they want to be designer, they want to handle regulation and certification, they want to be the manufacturer, uh, they want to operate the aircraft. And uh, if this were not enough, handle also the customer side as well. And this is quite a lot to take on. And this increases the risk, but also obviously the capital required for the startups. And I just want to give you a very illustrative uh, example. Imagine uh, on the one side Lufthansa going into manufacturing of airplanes and on the other side also engaging into the operation of such aircraft. So it would be, so to speak, um, an Airbus and Lufthansa combined. And this, uh, what you can already imagine, entails that next to the minimum capital threshold of 1 billion US dollars, which uh, is outlined on, on this chart, um, would need additional funding and capital for building the operational side, um, as all these startups uh, aim to enter the field of offering mobility as a service to the end customer. So coming back to my initial question, where and from whom do the billions of capital actually come from? And for this, I prepared an overview of uh, the top three funded startups 
where we see a mix of investors. On the one side, we see um, like typical VC funds, and on the other hand, corporates coming from the automotive um, sector, tech, but also insurance industry. And they can be um, broadly clustered into um, pure financial and strategic investors. And the latter ones are being the most important, important ones for these startups. But uh, more, in, in, more on this in, in a few seconds. First, if we look at venture capitalists, and to give you just some background information, a single fund of a typical VC boutique contains on average 135 million US dollars, at least in the US. And this uh, capital is usually used to, to be spread uh, between 30 and 80 startups. Some invest in a single company, some even uh, invest in more than 80. But what you usually see is that this is a small drop in the ocean of, what's, of what those air taxi startups need in capital to really take off and become a mainstream mobility option. So it's actually the strategic investors who can kind of save the industry from becoming a bubble as these corporates have the means and also capabilities for, sca for scaling fast and um, for, for mass manufacturing those vehicles. Just think about a Daimler, a Geely, a Toyota or Hyundai who produce millions of cars per year. And this is exactly the capability these startups need. Um, yeah, and if you, what you can see is that Jolly and, and also Volocopter are well positioned in this regard as they have backing from um, a, yeah, from these companies, from these type of companies. What the automotive companies lack though, is obviously expertise and experience of moving into the third dimension. And that's where airlines can play an important part, um, as they possess capabilities, but also knowledge to add value to these startups in questions related to operational side, pilot training, but also meeting the very high requirements of certification set by such as uh, FAA or EASA. So to conclude, um, we expect to see even more engagement from the automotive industry given the large production volumes and manufacturing type that these air taxis uh, require. Airlines on the other hand most likely will be more reserved in actively investing in such a startup due to multiple reasons, but may most likely position themselves as a strategic partner. And here I'd like to mention the recent partnership announcement uh, between Lufthansa Industry Solutions and Volocopter, uh, which has been announced yesterday. And uh, lastly, um, startups in this space need um, foremost strategic investors with a very long term investment horizon and also the willingness to invest large sums in the vision as they are in need of their upper three digit million or even billion of dollars to realize their final vision. Thank you, Colin. Um, that's so interesting. Yeah. I have um, a couple of slides left. Or OK, go ahead. Go ahead. And then I have a, a quick question for you. Yeah, very quickly. So how do I see the future? Um, despite my yeah, critical discussion, I'm, really, I'm a big fan of um, and I believe in the air taxi industry. Uh, so don't get me wrong about this. Um, but I think it's just important to put some more realism to the conversation. Um, it will be quite interesting to see um, and, and to, to observe where this, where this um, space is evolving in the next few months and, and even years. And, um, but I think that, that we will see it um, at some point, maybe 5, 10, 20 years. And lastly, um, I would just like to highlight um, our, um, our platform that is really accessible. So, um, we share all of our research from the Lufthansa Innovation Hub on our tnmt.com platform. So feel, feel free to visit and sign up for our bi-weekly newsletter. And which is even more important, um, we are currently in the process of publishing a very comprehensive and data-driven air taxi report um, with insights that, um, yeah, that have never been published before. Um, it's a co-brand report in cooperation with Klaas Klaasen, who is the head of the UAS Capability Center at Lufthansa Technik. And um, the report will be published within the next four, four to five weeks. So uh, I would encourage you to sign up and um, happy to um, send you the report once it's launched. And Thank you so much. And we can share this as well on our, um, on our post uh, event communication. Nice. Let's
thanks a lot. Um, yeah, thanks for the attention, and I hope um, that everyone who's currently watching is also as excited as I am, as, as I am to see the first commercial air taxi take off. I'm sure they are. Thank you. Thank you, Colin. OK, well, we're going to get um, Florian's uh, presentation up and running. I just have one little question for you, Colin, and that is what is the um, investment background behind um, maybe the kind of um, airport situation or the landing situation um, within cities? Shared helipads, what, what, is, what is the approach here? For the infrastructure, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's, um, that's one of the most important um, um, topics that, that we need the infrastructure. Uh, we have those um, concepts, I would call them, um, or initiatives um, can land. Um, but I think that, that airports in general, for example, the Hamburg Airport or the Munich Airport, uh, can, can be used as, as a starting point. Uh, and also the, um, the Deutsche Bahn, for example, is working on, on such uh, solutions where uh, heliports could be used, um, could be built up on um, train stations within Germany. So um, wow. this could be a solution. Fantastic. Thank you. OK, I see now that we have Volker Golnick um, ready to present. So I would like to hand over now to him. Florian, Volocopter, sorry, excuse me, we were we were having trouble getting Volker on, so we're going to put Volker a little bit later, and Florian, then the floor is yours from Volocopter, Florian Adolf. Thank you. Yes, hello, so then let me quickly start the presentation, make sure that it works. So I hope you can see the presentation. We can see it. OK, good. Yes, so hello and welcome um, to my uh, brief overview, if you will, to, uh, to um, what we are doing at Volocopter, especially with respect to autonomous flight. So the, the basic idea uh, of this presentation is really to, to carve out the um, the possibilities, challenges, a bit of a background to what specifically our vehicle and also the infrastructure that was mentioned before really contributes um, towards the, the vision that we just saw before that everyone is working on. And uh, so I'm happy to, to basically start off with where did it all start from? So commercial aviation today, um, yeah, brief example, and thanks for these great images uh, on, that I found on Instagram. Uh, that gave a really nice impression of what pilots today, including Lufthansa pilots, of course, uh, have to face every day, and it needs a lot of training. So as you can see, you have up to yeah, 40, 50 steps before you can even start the aircraft. And uh, not even talking about flying, uh, risk mitigations, what if something goes wrong, uh, if you have to change plans. So this is extremely complicated, and it's well established with a lot of uh, training of people. Um, that's that's have uh, figured out the exact details to really have a fleet uh, safety level that is unprecedented and makes this industry so safe. On the other hand, our founders, I mean, when they started tw uh, 2011 um, with their their idea of uh, having built the first volocopter prototype, if you will, um, they looked at the drone industry. So they said, hey, these things are so easy to fly, but not every drone but per se is actually easy to fly. Um, they said, well, why not put a people on this? So where do we have the differences here with the drones? So this one example is of uh, FPV flight, uh, first person view. Those are used for entertainment uh, these days and they're really racing uh, across, they're yeah, very low and very fast over the ground. They're hard to fly, they're more racing cars, but they're fun and simple and, and very robust. Then on the other hand, you have a very easy system that everyone can buy these days. Uh, it uses a GPS for navigation and has computer vision on board so that you can make really nice footage and you see these across YouTube everywhere since, uh, since its beginnings. So 
it's so easy to fly that even uh, little kids today uh, can actually go out and, and operate a drone and, and can make it follow them while they take a walk or uh, enjoy their, uh, their time on a bike. So this was the basic idea. How can we bring this technology into uh, manned aviation? So this is how it actually started. Um, I don't want to go into the details of the first flight uh, as we want to focus on automation, so taking the human pilot out actually, but just to give you a perspective. So um, what we really try to do is uh, merge the best of both worlds, so small drones and commercial aviation to make our vision come true. And in this example, it all started uh, almost 10 years ago when the flying yoga ball made its history with over 1 million clicks within the, within the day. And even NASA uh, said, hey, we never achieved this before. So uh, can, you, can you come over and explain how you did this? And this is where, you, where we started from. So here's a, a quick video of um, yeah, some, some nice impressions that already gave us a first taste of what it means to fly a passenger carrying a drone uh, or a multi-copter um, near an uh, uh, urban area. So this was initially the, the first flight that uh, I guess everyone is well aware of, uh, where we uh, took flight in Dubai. And it gave the vision a first feeling. Then last year, even more importantly, we showed how this could be integrated, uh, in this case with a pilot on board in an international airport. So. This gave us the confidence that we're also on the right track with this whole integration topic, that we're not just building the, the vehicle. And finally, last year, uh, we also demonstrated the, the flight of the helicopter in Asia, in Singapore, uh, where we took a demo round in the marina bay, so really uh, very much into the city. Um, we had the whole flight operations uh, figured out. We translated basically our certification from Europe to Singapore. So that was also a big learning and it showed uh, that, that this concept scales and also other authorities have trust in it. As it was mentioned before, we are aiming at the whole ecosystem, but um, we also have uh, yeah, strong partners, as you mentioned, uh, strategic investors uh, plus partnerships like the announcement yesterday on the Volo IQ, so the digital backend that I will come to in a minute. And um, this is all necessary to make this um, a seamless experience for everyone who is supposed to travel on these aircraft safely. And so um, it is a natural thing that we have to zoom out from the actual aircraft and also see all other aspects that are important, namely the, um, yeah, the uh, data processing and risk and management, the flight operations, the air traffic integration, and the flight hubs and the services for that. And uh, I don't go into detail this uh, presentation on the cargo drone that you may have seen the announcement this uh, the, the past months, uh, but um, as an obvious uh, next step, we said, well, if you can transport passengers, why not start to transport cargo here? So Volo AQ um, it was announced yesterday and we made this public with, together with Lufthansa Industry Solutions uh, running on Asia. Uh, we are starting to build the digital backend for this because everything that automation needs is data in the first place. So if you have no data, there's nothing to automate. And that's why it is so important to start from this uh, very, in the very beginning, have a, have a digitalized uh, set of processes that we basically replace what is done still very in an analog way and paperwork even sometimes um, in order to also quickly have uh, flight approvals, uh, maintenance done and so on. But there's more infrastructure to that. So if we want to think about automation, it's important to understand the actual environment where we are flying. So in this uh, visual, you, you can get a feeling on uh, where we would uh, build up our takeoff and landing infrastructure. We want to make sure that we take the minimum noise uh, flight path and, and glide slope. So similar problems that you're facing with uh, airports. So we need to we need to consider this to to maximize the acceptance. Um, we also have to consider this for all the technology that is required to navigate safely in those environments. We may take off and land over water, uh, fly over water. We may uh, do the same thing on parking lots. So there are many, many possibilities and uh, companies are investing already in that. And we, from the autonomy perspective, uh, take this very serious that the infrastructure has to match your aircraft and the mission. 
So another infrastructure is airspace integration. I mean, if we look at what uh, drone rules today already require in order to uh, make the operations of drones, especially beyond visual line of sight safe, we uh, can say that this is up to 80% safety activities that just uh, treat the airspace integration side or the air risk. And that's why uh, we considered it uh, so important milestone last year to demo the first integration on an international airport. None of those planes had to stop the operation. It wouldn't have been feasible. So uh, we were flying right next to them and we were um, yeah, accommodating this for the pilot in this case, but nevertheless, the whole processes, the digital interfaces, this was all there. And so U-Space or the Euro European UTM um, as it's, it's called in other countries all very often. This will be uh, our, another, let's say, backbone and also regulatory backbone in order to allow for, um, yeah, allow for those automated flights. But coming back to the aircraft, I mean, it's, uh, it's still an interesting thing for everyone uh, who's yeah, into aviation, look at the aircraft itself because it tells a lot what you can do with it. And we believe that the Volocopter is over these you now fourth generation of uh, its vehicle fleet, uh, well mature to go into the commercial launch. So every time from the experimental, then the proof of concept and the prototype, and then now this commercial launch, we we achieved two things. First was uh, we were operating them with a pilot on board, but also with remotely piloted as an unmanned aircraft. This is very important because we did not have drastic design changes to, to, to exercise here. So we gained experience how to operate the same airframe under totally different operational uh, circumstances. And uh, this way we um, yeah, accumulated in over 1,000 flights since 2011 with, with the test fleet, particularly with the 2X test fleet. And uh, now we have the, um, the certification program going on uh, that is going all into the Volocity um, uh, aircraft. Now, what is Volocity about? Why is it so special? Um, yeah, it, it resembles all the, the experiences and learnings that uh, we gained over the past years and, and uh, comes up with a really safe design that is a, a not only for the piloted case where the pilot on board is uh, uh, flying the mission with a single passenger, but also for the automated flight, the big enabler. The multiple redundancy in the propulsion, the, noise the low noise signature, uh, the quick battery swap concept, um, the low operating cost, the high payload, all of these uh, are and a technical enablers plus the safety level that we talk about here. So this typical 10 to the minus nine that uh, some of you may uh, have heard of. This is a 10 to the minus nine failure per flight hours as a, as a safety uh, target level of safety that uh, you know from commercial airliners today. So when you enter your A320 and you fly from Hamburg to Munich, um, then this is this type of aircraft we're talking about. And now we bring this together with uh, basically drone technology as our founders envisioned. And we do this in the so-called SCV tour category enhanced. Now, where are we with respect to certification? Um, it's important to design, build and operate our aircraft. So as it was mentioned before, we, we have to be able to um, yeah, be the Airbus and Lufthansa in one, if you will. And for that, we uh, achieved the, the design organization approval, we are a production organization, and it is in preparation to become an air operator. Um, because of the very special nature of uh, how we want to operate this aircraft, uh, we can also start leaner through this process. So uh, aviation as we know it today, or commercial aviation as we know it today, also did not start at the full scale as we know it today with uh, millions of passengers uh, flooding the airports. So here we have the possibility to start lean and then uh, step by step grow into this, but <clears throat> always with the backing up of the authorities so that we are uh, operating at the highest level of safety. So why is this a big foundation for automation? Well, this airframe and the uh, way we operate it will be uh, at, a, at a maturity level that makes automation simply easier and then we don't have to, um, yeah, take care about a lot of the edge cases that you may find on conventional helicopter operations, for example. But what type of operations are we talking about? Well, with EASA, we are 
already drafting the, the next generation of regulations. Um, they want to learn how a vehicle is supposed to operate, what is possible, and then they share their view with us and tell us what is um, yeah, regulatory-wise possible or not. And in this dialogue, um, two of the priority use cases were identified for, for us. So the operation type one is not relevant. This is IFR cargo, large airplanes, but operation type two and type three, as they are called, they map to what we saw before from the experimental and proof of concept aircraft. So pilot and command on board, this will be the initial operations. So also initial commercial operations. So here we, uh, can already start to transport people, establish the first routes, infrastructure, and so on. But then with the remote pilot on command, this is uh, where, the, where the, yeah, the scaling effect will also come in. So here we will first start on predefined routes with this use space available. Um, some option to maybe change with the pilot on board or off board can, it can be possible. And of course, it comprises passenger and cargo transport. So that's why we also depict uh, our drone project here. And this will be then the big enabler. When it comes to safety and security, um, it's important to mention that in our design, we definitely um, highlight this in each and every system component that we know about the different yeah, onion shells uh, that's, that make the operation, the airspace, uh, the operator approval, uh, the unmanned aircraft design and the remote crew training uh, as safe as possible so that they add the safety. And this is basically uh, yeah, a Swiss cheese model, um, as, as many in the safety engineering know it. And here we have a lot of possibility because of the new technologies that are out there. And each of those layers adds uh, uh, safety and can compensate uh, the possible um, yeah, weaknesses another technology may have. This needs a careful analysis and also a dialogue with the authorities if they accept that uh, we combine certain technologies where we where we think they are safe to combine. Um, but this is um, definitely the, the the most promising way to stick to this culture and this design principle uh, also for automated flights. Now, when it comes to um, yeah using more advanced type of algorithms, uh, many people these days um, yeah shared their opinion. Yeah, what about AI? Yeah, so-called AI. Um, we, we were also running demonstrations or, of initial tests with our full-scale aircraft here. So what you see on small drones is that navigation without GPS or um, air risk detections for detecting a voice, for example, in, but including image understanding for ground risk classification, that those functions are actually possible. They can be computed in real time. And here in this example, we uh, collaborated with Behlerlin, a startup which was recently um, yeah, awarded also with the Swiss AI um, award. And um, yeah, they demonstrated that those functions are, uh, are really, really useful in this context. But of course, certification is uh, still a long way to go, but we are carefully monitoring that, especially since EASA has released the AI roadmap, which uh, comprises the, um, also the, the, the turning point at which they think um, it would be possible to use uh, AI uh, for different type of uh, functions, either normal mode functions or safety critical slash emergency functions on commercial airline operations or commercial air transport operations. So um, this gives us uh, the confidence that we are on the right way and that we can trust those functions to be available um, as, as, um, as they mature over time and as we, we uh, get more specific on the design principles. But also when you look at where AI will be particularly useful, I mean, I talked about the air taxi use case so far. But when we uh, want to expand, as we announced with our collaboration on ADAC, so the, um, the air rescue operator here in Germany, um, it, is, it is very important to, to understand that those environments are much more challenging than if we were just to fly between Vertiport and Vertiport. This in itself to make the surface also very, uh, very challenging. Um, and we are working on this, but when we want to land even in this, uh, yeah, uh, even more hazardous uh, landing and takeoff areas, as you can see them here in these example pictures. This will definitely need more, um, more equipment, more training, so that uh, one day we can fly this also without a pilot. And this is where 
um, AI can be of the biggest use to just help the pilot uh, understand the environment better and warn him from potential dangers. Now, wrapping it all up together, I would like to show you um, yeah, two, two and a half minute video um, about our vision, how all these systems play together. And uh, yeah. At Volocopter, we have been setting the standard for urban air mobility since 2011, with over 1,000 test flights. Our latest generation, the Volo City, will soon start commercial flight operations, first piloted and later autonomously. What makes urban air mobility so interesting? Quite simply, it is extremely safe. In aviation, the highest safety standards apply to infrastructure, aircraft and all processes. Today, autopilots already play an important role in this safety-critical environment. However, with a human pilot still supervising the automation on board. We are working on the next stage together with European aviation authorities. We are developing regulations for autonomous Volocity flights. Redundant systems will take over the tasks and duties of the pilot, on the ground and on board. Several sensors ensure a 360-degree view and detect all objects in the air. An independent monitoring system will keep an eye on all components at any given time, whether radio communication, propulsion or flight plan. Without the system's approval and permission, no Volocity takes off. The Flight Management System, or FMS for short, will make many decisions and automates predefined processes, always on time, correctly and safely. Before takeoff, the FMS will have access to extensive traffic weather and obstacle data, even without a data connection to the ground. The Volocity will be connected to U-Space, Europe's digital airspace management system. This ensures smooth and safe processes with all other airspace participants. Additionally, it will also have a direct connection to the Mission Control Center. Here, all flights are monitored by specially trained remote pilots, and passengers on board can talk to our staff at any time. The Volo City will operate on defined routes from Voloport to Voloport. There are virtually thousands of trajectories in the air to choose from for one route. The best route will be determined before each takeoff, based on weather conditions, traffic density, and noise considerations. Always on and always connected. The FMS and the independent monitoring system will be permanently active in order to detect and react to potential hazards. Whether birds or drones, the Volo City will locate them early. If the flight path is crossed by another airspace participant, the Volo City will calculate whether a speed reduction or a route change is necessary, a fully automated process, all within milliseconds. This is how we will enable safe, autonomous flight for urban air mobility. We are ready, are you? Volocopter. We bring urban air mobility to life. So um, guidance and navigation is important. As we know, the vehicle always has to know where it is, um, but we can't solely rely on GNSS or GPS, uh, Galileo, um, all these systems um, that, that are not under our control. So uh, here we definitely have to um, have additional methods to, to secure this. Um, detect and avoid, as it was mentioned, like rescue helicopters, uh, zeppelins flying over Frankfurt. So we all have seen these scenarios um, over and over again. So it is important to consider that in the design of, uh, of our operations and also of the aircraft. Airspace integration, so there are great concepts underway, especially now in Europe and also when we look at the FAA world. Um, and also in Asia where, where we see that the digital airspace is coming. Um, of course, a lot of details still have to be figured out, but I'm positive that or optimistic that uh, we we will have this available as soon as our aircraft is also um, able to to mitigate the relevant edge cases. And this is uh, sooner than later. So with the first level of airspace integration services, we, we can have uh, this available already today. 
uh, with the first level of services um, from products that you can buy today. Runtime assurance is a key aspect. Um, so pre-flight checks, everything automated in a way that uh, the system always uh, independently checks of uh, what, is, what its own state is. Uh, digital maps and flight planning, as, as we know, it also a very manual process uh, still today, but um, there are ways to, to accelerate this. Um, also talking about passengers, you know, the passenger needs a, a human machine interface uh, so that we can safely interact with them, know what's going on. Is there anything uh, that's that might uh, be even uh, of his concern or that he wants to get an explanation for? Um, so this is really uh, important as well because there's no one sitting next to him at this point. And I think um, with, with the concept we are following right now, it's, it will be, uh, have a lot on the acceptance as well. And then, yeah, um, all the other technical details uh, that we already mentioned and shown also in the video. Thank you, Florian, so much. When it's, yeah, when it comes to the uh, yeah, taking a seat here, uh, it is really about um, yeah, taking a seat in our vision. So we built up the Velocity mock-up and really happy to, to uh, share more progress as we go throughout the next years. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very, very interesting presentation. And it sparked one quick question while we're um, loading Felix's presentation up next, who's uh, going to join us in one second. I have a question from the audience from Martin Wilkin, and that is Florian. Assuming you'll start with a scheduled mode of operations, are you expecting to develop into on-demand flights and by when? Um, on-demand flights, I would uh, see uh, towards the end of this decay. And so where on-demand, I would uh, now interpret as also the, the route or <clears throat> the different, the different um, yeah, routes that we could possibly fly, that this is also chosen more or less on-demand. As I've shown in the beginning, the, um, the predefined routes are set as a baseline, and I think we then can take it from there as soon as we, we can show that this is uh, possible to do safely. Okay, I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about costs because I also have some questions later about uh, passenger costs, but let's get on to Felix um, and uh, and we can discuss this later in the question <coughs> and answer period. Felix, go ahead, please. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Felix Lee from Mihang. So I hope I'm not on mute, right? Can you hear me? No, you are not on mute. We can hear oh, you loud and clear. Oh, excellent, excellent. Hi. Go ahead. Felix and. Uh, uh, thank you for, uh, to having me here and uh, today I will talk about, uh, discuss about the autonomous aircraft manufacturer and uh, the, um, the POC uh, projects, what happened in China. And uh, in the last whole picture, you can see different product portfolio from Mi Hang. The, and uh, what, who we are is the, we are urban air mobility platform provider and operator, but uh, we can do the pro operator part in China. Outside of China, we will, we will only be the, the pro, platform provider. And uh, for the Yihang Ho product and also system, we have mainly the passenger transportation uh, in the left set. And for the logistic, we have the smart city management and also uh, for the air median uh, solutions. And uh, to make all these kind of things happen, we also need the landing pass, the, the, the command control center parts, and also uh, different kind of uh, um, charging platforms. Uh, next slide, please. This is the the, the basic our um, technology platform, and the, for the uh, because we divided uh, is the two two parts. One is for the passenger, one is for the uh, cargo and the logistic. For the passenger, we have the Yihang 216 with two seats, and the Yihang 116 with one seat. And uh, for the non-passenger uh, AVs, we have the Falcon. The payload is uh, up to five kilogram, and uh, we have the the firefighting drones. And uh, this is just released uh, uh, two months ago. And uh, we have uh, the Yihang 216 Air lo for logistic. For the uh, maximum takeoff weight uh, about uh, 200 kilogram. And uh, oh, sorry. And then um, we also have uh, uh, to 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 support the the, the operational uh, perspective. We need to have the uh, the command control center. This center will be the bridge between the your vehicle and to the ATM ATM uh, uh, system. And next stage, please. Next slide, please. 
And this is uh, in last year, uh, December, the 38 delivery to our local partners who have mainly the sightseeing business. And uh, in the next uh, uh, three uh, uh, videos, I will show you uh, what's uh, following the time development, what's the Yihang uh, strategy and also the product development and why we changed and adapt to the uh, to the developer of the whole marketing uh, dynamics. And uh, uh, next slide, please. Because uh, from uh, uh, after in the forgone, in the last uh, uh, three four years, um, we spend a lot of uh, energy to develop to to figure out what will be the right use case in different phases. I mean, different phases is a different uh, um, uh, um, technology uh, uh, phases, different uh, um, platform phases, and uh, at least in China, one of the biggest. Uh, 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 Market ready businesses for the sightseeing because even till today, there's more than uh, 1 billion people never flying in China. So if they have an opportunity to take off into the sky, to just in the sky to look into the, the beautiful uh, uh, countries, they were very happy. So um, we later in the videos, I will show you uh, in some Shandong province and uh, some other provinces. And um, uh, for the passenger transportation, now what we have already achieved in China is mainly in the uh, Bay Area or in a uh, uh, not crowded area without building uh, a rural area flying to do the uh, demonstration. And uh, for the logistic part, um, uh, we just released the, the uh, Yihang 216L. And uh, you will also see a video because uh, in this kind of video, you, you have all kinds of emissions. Uh, next, please. Yihang has already moved the future of transportation into the present. But we are aiming to go further. Now, our goal is to improve urban public transportation and make urban commuting safer, greener, and more efficient. Ehang's autonomous aerial vehicles are safe and stable aircraft that are essential for urban air mobility. They do not require extensive flight experience. The future is here today. It's something totally different when you fly over the lake really high up and it's great. I really love it. But taking the airspace into in the use is fantastic potential, both for transporting goods uh, and then also having to meet people. Ehang's AAVs have unique features that differentiate them from other proposed urban air mobility solutions. Their full redundancy systems are continuously optimized to be able to respond to different situations and keep passengers safe. Furthermore, the autopilot of the AAV can provide passengers with a relaxing, stress-free flight experience powered by clean energy. Modularized Ehang E port supports a complete automatic circulation system. Just like a transportation hub for more traditional transportation methods, like trains and airplanes. Neither runway nor ground space are required for aerial vehicles to take off and land. With this system, traffic circulation is greatly improved. This is an innovative new approach to managing traffic and minimizing congestion within urban areas. Inside the e-port, the conveyor as well as the parking bots keep the system running smoothly. AAVs can be transported to different areas automatically for berthing, charging, and maintenance. 
and can be called to vertiports for the next flight. EHANG's Command and Control Center enables point-to-point -point flights or urban routes. Managed by trained pilots, it is a highly intelligent backstage control center that coordinates vehicle dispatch, route planning, and safety for EHANG AAVs to ensure that every flight is completed smoothly and safely. For us, innovation means helping people get from point A to point B faster, more comfortably, and more sustainably. In the near future, this system will work for every one of us. EHANG AAVs will become an essential part of our daily life, flying us into the future of urban air mobility. Thanks to the development of autonomous aerial technology, logistics is becoming automated and green. The Ehang 216L we are launching today is born for modern air logistics that requires more convenience, safety, and sustainability. It boasts a payload of 200 kg feet for short to medium haul air logistics in both urban and rural areas. Consistent with Ehang's core product concept of interconnection, autopiloting, and centralized management, it employs a multi-rotor structure consisting of eight arms, 16 propellers, full redundancy design, and distributed electric propulsion system to achieve multiple intelligent functions including vertical takeoff and landing, precise positioning, automated route planning, full-range automated flight, real-time network, dispatching, etc. In the foreseeable future, Ehang 216L will play an important role in different use cases such as emergency medical service, special situation express delivery, and offshore oil and gas transportation to help enterprise reduce costs and improve efficiencies. With the expansion in our AAV product line, we believe the future of intelligent air logistics has started right here and now. I think the video is already uh, running through, but uh, in the three uh, main videos, what we uh, I want to share with uh, uh, the, the other um, partners is that uh, um, there's a different perspective of POC. You have the uh, uh, first one is we need the proof of the technique, if the, it is work or not work. How is the concept? You know, to make the basically a drone, make it bigger, to make it uh, with the the the, the make, make it heavier and uh, whether this is workable or not you know uh, for three five years is a question but uh, um, through so many different flight testing 
we can prove that a quantum copter make it bigger. Is this technically possible? And uh, for the um, for the use case and also for the operational perspective, um, through all the 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 deliveries what we already achieved in China, it's um, it shows like uh, with this very easy concept, the operational cost is uh, um, reduced up to uh, sixty percent compared to a flight. Hour, I mean helicopter flight hours. This is uh, what we uh, nowadays already can achieve, and um, um, and uh, the, the the second one is that like, Yihang always focus on the autonomous flight because in the beginning from us we don't have the pilot on board. We want to achieve like the autonomous drive, but in the sky the autonomous flight is much compared to the uh, autonomous drive is much easier because it's not not that complicated. And um, the third part is the let's. Uh, why Yihang setting up the, the, the command control center? Because um, in the very early stage, we don't even have a way, I mean, for the authorization to control and monitor all kinds of risk. That's the reason why if we want to have our vehicle flying and into our operational phases, we need also have a management system for it. That's the reason why step by step we develop, we develop different systems. And uh, so far, uh, the most of the system is uh, uh, success successfully with function and uh, even go to the commercialization phases. Uh, can we go next, uh, please? So um, now we are uh, trying to um, keep developing the uh, technological leadership and uh, to uh, expand the manufacturing capacity, and uh, uh, now we already found one of the uh, most important partner, the FACC. They will produce our vehicle in Austria, and uh, of course, based on the Yihang 216, we always try to ex extend different uh, use, for example, for the firefighting, for the logistic, but the basic form, basic design from the vehicle is never changed. It's still the same uh, concept. And uh, through this way, we believe we can reduce the, the, the R&D cost and also accelerate the uh, mass production because the most of part we can exchange and use for the other vehicles. And um, in China, we're already starting the uh, commercialization, but uh, this kind of com commercialization is the, um, very special. There's a lot of Chinese cities. They just give us a very um special area region that we can do what we want with very special permissions and uh, then um we also it is for us impossible to do everything by ourselves that's the reason why we are always searching for different st strategic partnership to developing uh to to get the the, the most uh, bms to uh, get the most uh, better batteries better um navigation and the flight uh, system we also uh, uh, spend a lot of money to develop our own system, but we also need input from some other good companies to make it better. So, then this is the last second page. Uh, slides. Please go to the last one. Next slide, please. So, um, the, the, the message what I want to share is that a lot of people believe that the automobile flight, or at least the Evoto, will be a future mosaic. But uh, pure technically, it's already possible today because we approve it. That's the message. Thanks so much. Thank you, Felix. And I know that you've proved it because I've seen the videos of human beings going up in autonomous planes um, in China over Guangzhou, one young lady. And yeah. I have my ticket to do it at Volocopter because they did a promotion a couple of weeks ago. So I'm excited for my turn as well. I have a question for you while yes, we're um, loading the next, uh, the next slides. Um, a question that comes from Laura. All of you talk about the technical and legal hurdles, but how do you approach the third one, the public trust? From my point of view, one of the biggest barriers is yet to be overcome. So that's a question for you, Felix. And then I have my own spin to this question because I also spent time in China and I also met with your incredible 
ambitious government who has urban planning like the, the likes of uh, phantasmagoric plans, the likes of which I have never seen in another uh, country that I've been in. So the ambition is there. What about the people? What is the perception for flying I think, in a um, robot in China versus the West? This is a very good and interesting question because if uh, we look into the Chinese population with 1.4 billion people, you always have some people who really have passion and uh, crazy for aviation. Only for this kind of people, you know, what I want to say is that uh, um, at least during the, our uh, different uh, uh, um, uh, demonstration tour in different cities, every single person in the places want to try it. And if I go to this, if I do the same city tour in Europe, at least the 30 percent the normal people we are skeptic. Oh, what's this? I'm worried about. What's the noise? What's the, you know, this is different mentality. I think yeah. maybe from my personal point of view, um, the Chinese people are, we are, you are to be cool to try new things. You are yes. so cool to be crazy because we are too normal. The most people, we are so normal. If we have the opportunity to try something new, to try something different, we, want, we just want to try it. So I think this is maybe is the uh, culture difference. It's yeah. not a regulation or not a, you know, legal, it's no difference. In China, it's exactly, it, the air is exactly so complicated like EASA or FAA, the same. Mm. But mm. the people, the normal people, we just want to try something new. This is maybe a yeah. little bit different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I fully agree. Culturally, I fully agree with you. And um, I, in preparation for this event, I did a, a, on my Instagram, I did a poll and I said, how many of you would like to strap yourself into a drone and fly over a city? And I got 50-50 and my mother was one of the ones who said, never, I'm never doing that. And you're crazy, Aaron. And um, but we'll see who's crazy. I'm doing it. I'm excited. So thank you so much. Um, thank you. Uh, I have a couple of other questions for you, Felix, yes, while I'm at it. Interesting approach from Ehang to follow a step by step approach with the different fields of application. Uh, that's not a question, but it's a comment. And to Ehang. From Tony, do you have CAAC TC already and are there already regular commercial flights with passengers? Uh, to answer these two questions, the first one, we don't have the from CAAC the TC yet because mm -hmm. we believe we should have a different way because for the abnormal flight, if we follow the traditional aerosmith, this will take, I don't know how many years, maybe before I died, I couldn't see it. For the innovation, you also need an innovation for the Airworthiness, innovation for the regulations, mm -hmm. both. This is the first uh, question. The second is the yes, we do have some commer commercialized uh, uh, rules in China, but it's not uh, in a very uh, um, uh, we, without high population. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, that is perfect. We are now getting ready for Rohit from Uber. So. Um, the presentation is loading and I would like to now give the floor to Rohit Goyal. Um, right. yeah. um, Hi, Jack, take it away. You can hear me? Yes, we can. We can hear you loud and clear calling from San Francisco, right? Well, no, actually right now, no. <laughs> right now I'm in London, but uh, yes, I'm based out of uh, San Francisco. Oh, uh, okay. I thought that you had to wake up very, very early for this call. Uh, so anyway, yeah. that's great. Okay, so calling from London. So go ahead. We can hear you and looking forward. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for having me and, and great presentations uh, before me. So it could be a hard to follow, uh, like to follow all the great presentations. But here I am. I uh, just want to give a quick perspective on how Uber looks at Air, urban air mobility um, and just before that quick background on me uh, I'm part of the strategy team at Elevate and and we and my background is in aerospace engineering and my work is mostly focused around solving system constraints as it relates to noise airspace uh, weather um, and emissions etc so what I'm going to talk about today is going to be a little high level uh, just mostly our vision, uh, how we see the world and, and what part of urban air mobility we intend to target. At Uber, uh, as a company, we ignite the opportunity by setting the world in motion. That's our core mission. That's how the company was founded. And since and this was about 10 years back. And since then, 
we have scale to about 70 countries in the world and, and we have total rights served, riders served around 15 billion people. And on a daily trips level, we we do like an 80 million plus trips. Of course, this is the time uh, before COVID and, and like around the quarter one of 2020. So scale really makes a whole difference. We really understand how people move and we really understand like how where the pain points are for people when they move around in the city. So with that vision, and, and there's so much, um, there's only so much you can do on the roads. Uh, so roads are two dimensional and we have, as, as humanity, we have progressed to three dimensionals as many of us lives in buildings rather than houses uh, to accommodate uh, more number of people in constrained spaces. So same same kind of logic applies to transportation. Um, two dimensional world of roads um, is inc increasingly becoming constraining uh, as as the world is uh, coming closer to urban areas and up almost like is predicted in future about 80 percent. I think today it's well it's about 80 percent population lives in urban areas and the trend is increasing. So the congestion problem, the problem um, time spent on the roads and especially like in a city like San Francisco or, or LA, you can almost see people walking faster than your cars in downtown areas. So, so with that vision, we founded Elevate and the idea was to go, <laughs> excuse me, the idea was to go three dimensions and we are doing and we are looking to eliminate uh, or alleviate the congestion issues, the traffic problems, by weaving everyday flight of people and things uh, into the Uber platform. So we want to be like an, a taxi service in, in the air and so that we can serve uh, relatively long flight, long distance travels on the ground, but within the city. And we are achieving this through five major pillars. The first pillar is multimodal area ride shedding, and I'm going to go deep deeper into this aspect as I think this is super critical. Uh, this means that there would be a first mile and last mile uh, transfer in in the taxi world. You in the near term, you don't expect to fly from your backyard and land in someone else's backyard. So th this is a component that is going to be pretty critical. How seamlessly we are able to integrate service transportation with aerial transportation. Um, we need an aircraft that is acceptable by the public. Uh, a, it has to be highly efficient. Uh, secondly, it has to be acceptable by people, and and so hence we are looking at electric aircraft as, as the advancements in distributed electric propulsion have shown the high level of efficiency you can achieve with low noise and 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 like also redundancy in the systems. The connected sky, sky ports is basically you will need a dedicated you will need dedicated infrastructure to take off and land, and those sky ports uh, would be the ones. Um, in, in an urban area, you, uh, you will be brought to a skyport using a car and then you will fly to another skyport closer to your destination. Automation platform, this has been talked about in the previous presentations as well. Um, we expect the scale we envision this market to work in, in the future. Uh, we would need more like a automated air traffic management and in a digital way. The current method uh, that that we have for airlines do not necessarily scale um, at the level we expect this to happen. And finally, we don't we can't do this all alone as this is building a whole industry which has so many moving parts as other speakers have have alluded to. So we are doing this in partnership with with many partners that I'm going to kind of highlight in the later word. So what is Uber doing and what where are we leveraging the ecosystem? So Uber is is an internet company, is a data company and, and software uh, as, is at its core. So we intend to build the digital air traffic management or airspace management or slash it's called PSU in, in US. And then we also intend to provide the full multimodal experience. So we, we have a ground service obviously as most of you know, um, we will use, we will connect the ground service we have in, in the form of UberX or or Uber Black or any any of the ground services. We will connect it with the aerial platform and provide the full 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 trip experience. 
we expect to we are leveraging partners in the aircraft building world so we we are not an air aviation company necessarily who is building the aircraft so we are sticking to our strengths and we are relying on partners to stick to theirs so we have multiple uh, like partners that we have announced um, and like eight in total plus two in stealth and and those partners are building to our specification that we think um, would be needed for this market. And finally, the infrastructure um, for infrastructure as well. We are relying on the experts to own and operate these infrastructures. Uh, we will be the users of it and, and, and we don't intend to necessarily uh, own anything at this point. So just to give you a hero route of how a trip would work. Um, so you can see this is LAX to Staples Center. Uh, so Staples is downtown to um, downtown Los Angeles. You can see like a trip can be completed in about 27 minutes, but on the ground it could take about uh, one hour 20 minutes. Also you can notice the indirectness that is added. Um, so you not necessarily flying, you're flying straighter, but you're driving in a very convoluted way. Um, a key component of all of this is multimodal transportation. So at Uber, we really understand how the demand works and, and we know that to, we, we have served so many trips around the world that we really understand how to bring pool people in together, bring them from just different locations and then uh, pool people out as well. So what you are seeing right now is an illustration of how the pooling would work. Um, you will have about three or four passengers that would um, that would take the flight at the same time. Well, they will be brought by cars or other forms of transportation to a skyport, and then you will fly to another skyport. In this case, you're flying to Fremont or San Jose, um, <clears throat> and then there will be four cars again waiting for you, or number of passenger cars waiting for you to take you to your final destination. So with that in mind, obviously the multimodality piece is, is a tough concept to master. It hasn't existed in, in, in the past in a scale manner. Um, so to really just to mainly understand that piece, we launched a first consumer manifestation of our product Uber Air, um, and we call that product Uber Copter. So Uber Copter was launched, uh, is, is a helicopter service in New York City where you can fly from Manhattan to JFK and back. Uh, we follow the similar concept. Uh, you can book it by an Uber platform and wherever you are in Manhattan, you will be picked by a car and, and brought to a heliport where you will pull in with other passengers and then fly to JFK. Again, you will have the ground transportation available to you at the last mile. But obviously we all know that helicopters are not necessarily scalable solutions. Uh, for obvious reasons, they are uh, extremely complex machines to fly, um, not necessarily very economical as well to serve as a taxi market, um, and also is, is extremely noisy and, and like you know not tolerable to people, and, and that becomes a problem. So what we need is a different aircraft that kind of speaks to, that kind of solves all these issues. So we need something which is greener, so we need something electric so that we don't really add to to the emissions equation when it comes to aviation. Uh, and we need something which is super quiet. Uh, it, it has to be a product that is acceptable by the communities. Uh, otherwise, it's uh, if the consumers don't accept it, then um, all of this is not required really. So we need something which is super quiet um, and distributed electric propulsion uh, offers us that ability. And finally, obviously everything, it's aviation, so safety is, is the top priority and, and, and distributed electric propulsion again would allow redundant systems that we can have in place, like shown by the blue, blue uh, rotor here, which is not necessarily required to generate the lift, but uh, can, can act as a redundant system in case of a failure of another rotor. Next is the infrastructure. So this is again a key systems of systems that needs to be solved at, at a scale level. Um, we can't expect to, as I said, land and take off from the backyard in the near term. 
uh, and near term really just means like you know next 10 15 years i would say and you can't expect that and so we need dedicated infrastructure that can operate high throughput flights so we, to really achieve the economy of scales um, idea you you need to be able to fly as fast as possible uh, or like you know the turn time should be as minimum as possible so per, per hour uh, you need to fly as many flights you can to bring down the overall cost of the system which is then trans which is then passed to the consumer and ultimately the consumer is a benefit of beneficiary of it now this infrastructure does cannot just be placed anywhere um, so you really need to understand where the demand exists what are the hot spots in the city and where is it likely that people will try to take this trip so uber at its core is a data company we really understand um, how people move in the city we understand the traffic patterns and on a live basis on a historical basis um, and and we really understand like um, what kind of people uh, are experiencing like high congestion and high um, traffic in their commute times that we can come in and add value. So we have an internal tools called Flux, which basically enables those deep insights um, and tell us like where, where the trips can be originated <laughs> and where can they end. And this really helps us to figure out the appropriate Skyport location that uh, in a in an urban area and we can see the hot maps uh, the heat maps in in the area at least this is an illustrative map so we can see the um, like we can map around the cities the traffic uh, congestion we can map around uh, where the hotspot for demands are um, and that's where you would want to place your skyports and then we, we can optimize it. Uh, we can, at Uber, uh, what we have pioneered in our ground transportation service is an ability to run a vast transportation network in the most efficient manner possible. And that's why Uber is so much cheaper than, than a regular taxi service, so much more efficient, and, and that's what we have mastered. And this is something what we intend to bring to aerial ride sharing, which, um, all the economic models I have seen and have built uh, is the key component is the is the load factors and the high utilization that you you need to bring down the lower prices, which will increase the demand and overall would add much more value to citizens of the world. And we can do this for any city in the world. I mean, we are in about 700 cities around um, around the world and almost every metropolis uh, that exists, that there exists. And we can run similar sort of models that we have built and mastered over the years in any city uh, around the world. So this is again, I'm talking about um, an ability to scale and, and bring down the overall cost of the system, which is then transferred to the consumer and, and ultimately the consumer is the beneficiary. Now, coming to the last few slides here, uh, our network strategy also informs what kind of aircraft we would need. So we, we have done extensive data simulations to see like, you know, what kind of speed, uh, what kind of speed we would need, payload, uh, so like pilot plus passengers uh, so that we can amortize the cost um, or divide the cost of the flight by four. Uh, what kind of range do we expect? We strictly aim to be uh, intra-city um, uh, aerial ride sharing service, so we are not necessarily looking at this point um, intercity concepts. And again, we talked about the quietness of the aircraft. This has to be fundamental in the design of the aircraft, that, that the aircraft needs to be significantly quieter than helicopters of similar weight class. And this is important to achieve the throughput I talked about at the, at the Skyport level. They need to be electric um, and they need to be much more reliable than what we have in um, current day helicopters. So finally, we this will what we intend to do is uh, that Uber Air service would be available by an Uber app. So a regular Uber app that you and I use, you will see an option of Uber Air when it becomes available. 
we have already um, done a full dry run, so to say, with Ubercopter in New York City, and we have built all the backend systems uh, when it comes to showing that, uh, when it comes to integrating that with the regular Uber app. So it will be as as it is easy today to book a car using an Uber app uh, in a very seamless, efficient manner. This is what we expect to do for our for urban aerial ride sharing services as well. Erin, that's all I got. Uh, over to you. Well, Rohit, that was amazing. Thank you so much. And we have questions um, pouring in from before. And I have um, just a question right now, just one from myself, actually. Um, what exactly, when all of this is up and running, how, what is going to be the price point? Um, you must have made some yeah. uh, some projections of how your growth is going to go. What do you think would be a price point for a cross-city trip? Yeah, 100%. Um, and I did have a slide on this on, on that one, which I had actually removed. But the price point in the starting time, uh, it's going to be pretty controlled um, kind of like flight services in the starting. So we expect to hit about a $6 per passenger mile number mm -hmm. uh, in the start. And over time, we uh, once we start to become more efficient and increase load factors and utilization of the aircraft, we intend to bring it down to Uber X level, mm -hmm. you know, which, is, which is like much lower than obviously $6 per passenger mile. And once the autonomy kicks in, uh, we intend to be piloted from the start. And once the autonomy kicks in, uh, then we um, intend to bring it down to the level of car ownership. So that is like the car ownership is the lowest that can get there. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what we intend to achieve with with the lower price of the aircraft and extremely high utilization of, of the assets. Mm -hmm. And you said that you have eight partners and another two um, or another set of partners. Are you planning on when you, when you commercialize to work with an increasing number of operators and manufacturers or is this kind of the, the starting plan with these eight? Yeah, so the our partnership agreements are basically based on that we have a certain set of system requirements or aircraft requirements, meaning in, in the terms of speed, um, their their reliability and you know, like noise levels, etc. So, yeah, so the idea is that we will want to operate all of them whenever they are available. Um, and as far as I know, like not everyone is, uh, our goal is to launch end of 2023 timeframe. So still pretty close. We, we're still targeting those that timeframe, even though due to COVID, uh, we're still um, going forward with that plan. And, and whichever aircraft in, in our partners uh, will be certified is what we would intend to operate. Fantastic. Thank you so much. So interesting. So very, uh, yeah, your your motto, the uh, closer than you think is really, um, it's really going to be amazingly close, especially considering that we're in this COVID bubble and that time seems to be at once frozen and on the other hand, uh, going really quickly. So um, I think 2023 is going to be really around the corner. Yeah. So moving on, now we have um, Volker Golnick from the German Aerospace Center with uh, the final presentation. Now, Volker is going to bring this into the overall work that he has done over the past uh, decades, um, all about future cities and future airspace and about the vehicles themselves. So coming a little bit more from a regu regulatory um, perspective and government view, and also with um, a real life example of what they're working on in Hamburg to make the city uh, one of the pilot projects. So Volker, Welcome, and I give it to you, give you the floor. Yeah, thank you, Erin, for your nice introduction and uh, hello to everybody around the world. Uh, sometimes new technologies request some additional effort, but uh, thanks to Hildegard Schott, we made it to be online right now. Very uh, good. Do we, are we able to put your presentation onto presentation mode? Uh, it should be. It should be. OK, I have a presenter view so I can see the next slide. Um, all right, good. Go ahead. Sorry about uh, that. So um, 
yeah, uh, maybe we can take uh, some kind of helicopter perspective uh, on uh, urban air mobility. And uh, this is what we are doing since a couple of years in Hamburg for uh, the question, can we make urban air mobility come true? And uh, so I'd like to invite you to a short race through some uh, topics. Uh, about key questions around urban air mobility. Some of the previous speakers raised them uh, also. Some basics and definitions need to be addressed for sure. I would very briefly introdu uh, introduce our methodology, how we approach to the overall concept uh, definition. And then I like to show some first results and conceptual realizations uh, of uh, our research. By the way, uh, the research we are presenting here right now is uh, the result of a collaboration between German Aerospace Center and Hamburg University of Technology. There are two institutes who are working very, very close um, on that topic. So it's a result of both organizations. You all see these various uh, concepts um, sometimes on paper, but uh, luckily also a lot of them are uh, real uh, concepts like we have seen today from uh, Ehang, from Volocopter and uh, also Uber. And uh, the questions around urban air mobility are, will it be manned or unmanned, piloted or unpiloted? So do we talk about passenger or cargo? Is it scheduled or unscheduled? One of the questions in between has uh, raised this topic and uh, what are the missions we are talking about? Is it inspection? Is it transport? Is it surveillance? So you see there are many, many questions and much more than the ones listed here. Where shall we start? Some key questions we put on our list uh, are the following, which is the right method to provide a resilient feasibility proof? of this new transportation concept. And a very important po topic is what kind of demand could be expected? What could uh, various air traffic architectures look like in urban environments? Uh, which infrastructures do we need? Also, this has been answered in some way uh, by the previous um, presenters. And um, also the question how may flight rules and uh, networks look like is one of the very important things. And uh, last but not least, uh, the societal impact. And the final question, is there an added value despite the enthusiasm to create something new? And what about potential costs? So these are key questions which drove us and drive us uh, up to now through our research uh, investigations. Maybe you can say all these questions have been answered in the past, at least by various uh, publications from consultancies, uh, like the one here from Porsche, where we also contribute to. And uh, you see there are a lot of figures available, but um, these, from our perspectives, are more or less qualitative um, results. So, First of all, when we step into the depths to urban air mobility, I think there need to be some definitions um, given, uh, which give a clear picture of what we are talking about. First of all, urban air mobility from our perspective covers drones, but also air taxis. It's manned or piloted, but also unmanned. We talk about passenger transport, cargo transport, and special operations where we summarize everything which is not uh, cargo or passenger. Another very important question um, is what is an urban area? It's much more than a city. It's covering some districts, some counties, some states. At least it's a larger area. And if you look at the table below, you see a rough comparison of the Los Angeles uh, area, the metropolitan region of Hamburg, and also the German Ruhr area. 
There are some similarities. There is a spread of inhabitants uh, and also population uh, density. But I'd like to draw your attention to the last uh, line where we talk about districts and local countries. In the metropolitan uh, region of Los Angeles, we have 15 districts. And in uh, the Hamburg metropolitan uh, region, we have four states involved. The background of that is there are at least in that uh, example, four different legal governmental organizations who have all their particular interests, strategies and politics. And these need to be considered when we talk about the realization of an urban air mobility concept for such a larger region. Another very important uh, topic is about automation. What is the level of automation? And uh, I like to refer here to the German Ethical Council and uh, this gave a definition in 2017 of various levels of automation. Nevertheless, um, the most important point is the level four fully automated flight is the one where pilots monitor the entire flight operation of the vehicle. And the important thing is the pilot, the human being, is the last decisive position who takes the final decisions. And this is a major difference between autonomy, where the machine uh, takes all decisions, versus automation where the human being is still the final one who takes the final decision, especially if uh, situations uh, become vital. I think these three definitions are very important when we talk about urban air mobility. Now, further on, um, why did we look at uh, Los Angeles area? Because we have a very close uh, cooperation with NASA at Ames. Uh, we look at the Ruhr area because it's a very heterogeneous area in Germany, which is exciting due to its uh, particular characteristics. And for sure, due to the fact that our home base is Hamburg, uh, also Hamburg area is very interesting. And as you have seen, the distances the uh, size of the areas and also the population are very, uh, very uh, similar uh, of these three exemplary um, places. So that means for us, Hamburg metropolitan region is a predestined use case. And this is nice because uh, Hamburg has been announced as one of three so-called model cities for urban air mobility. And there's another exciting point uh, which makes Hamburg interesting because uh, Hamburg in its structure provides uh, some interesting problems. The first issue is about uh, the city airport, Fuhlsbüttel, where the control area covers wide areas of the city, but as you may see here on the top left um, picture, most of the approaches and departures uh, towards Fuhlsbüttel International Airport do not uh, cover or touch the inner city area of Hamburg. So this uh, gray zone is the city center of Hamburg where only 3% of the commercial flights go through. The other point for sure is uh, the Elbe River as a natural boundary or hurdle uh, comparable to hills. So it makes it interesting to us uh, to see how these boundaries may support the introduction of uh, um, air mobility. So once again, Hamburg is a good use case, that's why we stick to that. A short sentence to the um, methodology. Uh, we made a lot of workshops with experts, finding out that there are a lot of uh, aspects we need, which need to be um, addressed. That means, in fact, uh, 
we need information about urban data, topology, population distribution, income distribution, and some others. We also need information and a representation and modeling about the airspace concepts and architectures, and also an operational concept needs to be uh, developed, but also vertiport integration and um, vertiport concepts need to be considered before we can go into trajectory simulation and traffic routes uh, development. All this we introduced into a um, distributed modeling system, which is based on uh, open source architecture, which has been developed by another uh, DLR Institute in Cologne. It's a so-called remote component environment. I don't want to go too much into the technical details of that. Um, but it's a little bit uh, like a very flexible architecture where we can uh, introduce proprietary um, models and can link them together based on a common uh, description model. So this is the way how we try to implement all these considerations into an entire holistic model. And um, the next step we did is uh, we take some assumptions about how much demand and air traffic could happen in urban air mobility. And here we talk mainly on uh, people uh, or passenger transport. Assuming 1% of the daily commuter in Hamburg may take a, an air taxi, we have about 500,000 commuters in and out per day. That means, in fact, uh, 5,000 in the morning and also 5,000 in the evening will move forth and back to the uh, city of Hamburg. And the question is, where do they um, do that? And uh, this is what has been modeled based on statistical data we got. And um, so we found a daily distributed uh, demand. Not surprising, in the morning we have a peak and also in the evening. And we have here some of the districts of uh, Hamburg where we have uh, sources and things um, where air traffic may uh, make sense. And with the next question we ask is, uh, where can we place vertiports in the city? And this is only one extract of that for a certain district called Altona North, where we found areas where we can place vertiports. Based on all these considerations, we set up a first network work structure with a limited set of uh, routes where these air taxis uh, may run. And uh, the next question is, do we have sufficient capacity to operate all these vehicles? For that purpose, we investigated the capacity above Hamburg uh, in the air, which is uh, shared by commercial air transportation, air taxis, and also air drones. We defined, according to the international rules, uh, an obstacle clearance of uh, 300 meters, a maximum speed of uh, 300 kilometers, and an upper limit of the urban air, uh, airspace of about 2,500 feet. And um, taking this frame also into consideration, we have right now developed a deconflicting uh, and route planning, uh, including sub, uh, adapted separation uh, minima. Independency of weather conditions is really a sensor topic and uh, still an open issue, but also the real time uh, undisturbed communication, potentially based on 5G uh, mobile radio, is an important technology aspect of uh, a, a holistic solution. Taking all that, our proposal for Hamburg and also for others could be that we have a four level uh, network structure where we separate between the various directions, northbound, uh, eastbound and so on, in order to separate uh, the vehicles flying there. And uh, we found, and this was really a little bit surprising, 
adapting the, uh, the speed to the various separation uh, minima. In an extreme case, up to 18,000 simultaneous uh, flights could be hosted by the Hamburg Ace airspace, including the commercial flight. And this is a big opportunity. Fortunately, we do not need that uh, big amount, but uh, we have now a good feeling what could be realized at the very end. So there is no real uh, restriction on that. In cooperation with another university in a uh, different, uh, different uh, project, we may perform some simulations about various um, urban air mobility operations, distinguishing police, medical, firefighter services, but also parcel and taxi services. And uh, for that, um, we found that we can really operate this per day and you see here one of the results where in the morning uh, the traffic increases significantly we have a peak in the afternoon and uh, somewhere in the evening when uh, people go home we have another uh, peak and you see here in this uh, graph that especially police and medical and firefighter services yeah only provide a, a very small contribution, much less than 5% of the entire operations. Most is covered by um, parcel services and uh, air taxis. And this capability of simulation is very important because right now we can invite and bring together societal, governmental and industrial interests in order to create a consensus how to define such an urban air mobility system. Because we can really, based on consensus, also define limits in capacity which could be acceptable to the people living in, uh, in the city. We also have introduced a model about cost and revenue, and this is a cost uh, share of this uh, model, where we mainly based um, on a public a published uh, uh, model or uh, models or in uh, information. But uh, further on, we also made up our mind about uh, the contribution of the different parts, and you see here. For example, that the energy share of the direct operating cost is much lower than uh, the one for uh, kerosene in uh, commercial aircraft. Um, and uh, the reason for this assumption is indeed that uh, here only the electrical power costs are considered, but not uh, the cost of uh, providing batteries or other storage capabilities. Oops. On the other hand, we set up a revenue model, uh, which is very close to the fare system of taxis here in uh, Germany, where we have a fixed base and uh, a varying kilometer depending or distance depending fare. And here there are some variations um, between three to six uh, dollars per kilometer plus the fixed uh, or base fare. And what you see here is uh, that for sure, you high, uh, the higher the kilometer or distance depending fare is, the more profitable destinations or routes can be uh, achieved. And um, a big advantage of urban air mobility is since the direct routing could be around 30 to 50 percent shorter than uh, ground um, operations, we can have also not so high expenses uh, for taken, uh, taking an air taxi because the real distance is much shorter. So profitability is given in really many, much more than 50% of uh, the investigated routes. This brings me to the summary. Um, yes, um, urban air mobility is about air taxis and drones. 
Hamburg is a quite good uh, use case for such an investigation and uh, the modeling and assessment system we have set up provides all the features and capability um, in order to assess the feasibility and acceptance of such an urban air mobility concept. And I can tell you, yes, in principle, it works also in cities like Hamburg. And I'm personally fairly convinced uh, that this kind of mobility will come true very, very soon. And uh, the previous speakers have shown vehicles which can do that. And we have also the capability to balance the various interests uh, in our society. If you are more interested in that, there is a publication about uh, all the things I could raise here only in short. And uh, thanks a lot for listening. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. And what I think is so interesting about what you presented is the very, very soon part um, uh, reflects what the other speakers have talked about. And we would like to have probably some more specific information about what very, very soon means to Hamburg. Um, but also the other point that you made, which I thought was completely riveting, was that your price points are very similar to Rohit's from Uber. So um, I think that your calculations, um, they're not identical, but when you're talking about how much does a cup of coffee cost, we all know it's about five. Whatever currency we're in, it's about five bucks. Um, and here you're talking about very similar prices as well for rides. Uh, so that I thought was, yeah, quite interesting and does sound very close. Except, I, um, that, <laughs> except the price that we are saying is per mile. So if yeah. you're flying 10 miles, you're paying 10 times five dollars. So. Yeah. So definitely not a coffee. <laughs> oh, but that's the same price as a, a land taxi in Germany. So yeah, <laughs> so we, uh, we we were paying that anyway. So that's great. OK, so we have um, gone a little bit over with time, but I'm going to sacrifice my time at the end to give to you guys who are more interesting. I'm going to go through some of the questions here. Um, Anonymous, is it planned to outsource MRO activities, uh, CAMO part 145, etc., to third parties? Felix. Felix, you're on silent. Turn on all of your microphones, please. Felix, we can't hear you. Now? Can yes, you now yes. Oh, sorry, sorry, because I just tried, yeah. Um, I think for the MRO part, um, to outsource it is even a, a must because where we come from, we are a manufacturer. We know how to build, or how to design, how to testing our BVs, but uh, we have no idea. Um, uh, it's it's the difference between in China or outside of China because in China we need uh, we need also to be our operator. So we also um, will. Um, uh, to talk with some airlines to get more experience because the urban air mobility operation is just in the very beginning phases and uh, we need to learn about from the MRO. So this is uh, um, no doubt it's in China. We need to be at the main stakeholder, but talk with other partners to make it happen. And outside of China, I think um, um, as the OZ manager director, I will say we will outsource the muscle part because we don't have the enough resources, we don't have the right knowledge and also don't have the right competence to do the MRO by ourselves. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, yeah, the UAA, uh, UAM market has been steadily gaining momentum in recent years. In addition to obvious business areas, eVTOL operation, charging station infrastructure, air traffic management, other business models are likely to emerge to complement the market. So the question is, um, what could other business models be uh, that could complement the UAM ecosystem? I would like to ask um, Colin to take this one. Other markets to complement the ecosystem. Yeah, I mean, the, um, the overall UAM ecosystem is, is, is quite big, uh, so there's room for, for a lot of uh, players to 
to participate what I showed in, in, one, of the, in one of the slides. Uh, so it's not only um, manufacturing, but it's also uh, providing, for example, IT uh, infrastructure for developing an app, for example. Um, so there, there are many, uh, I would say, also not yet clear um, models or business models or opportunities, which we don't know yet, but which will be more clear in the next uh, few years to come. Um, but it also starts if you look at infrastructure, um, could there be a potential, um, could there be a potential business model emerge from, from this? Um, touching questions on who is the owner of the infrastructure on buildings, for example, and is this being made freely accessible? Is this some part of included in the ticket price, or how how does this look like? For you? Um, I think it's it's still in in in, uh, in, in the emerging development phase, but we will see quite a lot of uh, different models out there and emerging. Okay. Thank you. Rohit, I would like to ask you um, a different perspective on the same question. You have the entire ecosystem now in everybody's pocket and everybody's app and everybody's um, phone. Um, does Uber plan on controlling all of the ecosystem, uh, not with owner ownership of the vehicles, but with every other touch point in the travel chain or um, are you also looking at partnering with maybe traditional airlines or other parts um, of the travel chain with APIs into other digital platforms? How do you see this? Yeah, I mean, we, we certainly would look to partner with the airlines. Uh, I think they would be like a, mostly like a customer's uh, sense, uh, but we intend to provide the full experience from, from the time where you order a ride to the time you are arrive at your destination. So the first mile, last mile, we intend to operate the aircraft as well. And, and the reason we want to do all of it is because, as I've been stressing, it's all about, it all comes down to actually uh, the unit economics and unit economics is best served when uh, your network is at the highest efficiency level. And so we, if, if one entity operates the end to end, uh, the uh, it's easier to actually uh, maintain higher efficiency. And, and so, yeah, so we definitely intend to operate the whole whole uh, trip, so to say, and, yeah. and then like partnerships could be with the airline and with other players as well. So you could uh, fathom selling um, a long haul flight on a one of our big uh, customers <laughs> is watching today um, and that you own the customer and that um, the long haul flight is kind of in source to Uber. Yeah, I mean, this could be a business model down the line, I would say. Yeah, but so far, I mean, today, even for example, many airlines actually offer Uber services, right? I mean, yeah. you can actually do that today as well. So, so I think I can totally see the extension of it. If we sell a trip from Munich to, to SF, uh, I think. We'll have to see. Uh, that's pretty. Uh, I think that's that's a bit of a stretch, but uh, you know, we are a platform at the end of the day, so maybe yeah. uh, that could be a possibility as well. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a very good question here, which I would also have for myself, but comes in from anonymous. Um, I think probably one of our American um, viewers. How big will be the impact of Agility Prime in the U.S. and what are the disadvantages for non-U.S. players? Um, I don't know who should take this, but I would assume maybe Fulker could reflect on this because you do work with NASA and this is rather close to their realm. I, I, I think that uh, non-US uh, partners will have, will have a lot of challenges uh, to enter into the American market. That's uh, that my feeling at, at the moment. On the other hand, uh, in Europe, we, we do have uh, a very few providers or conceptual developers uh, of uh, UAM, and uh, I think it, it will be a very hard market um, for non-Americans uh, uh, to enter into the American mar market. Okay, thank you. Florian. I know that you've answered so a lot of questions on the uh, on the Q and A um, earlier, so um, I have one 
classic thing and how do you consider classic commercial aviation um is there something to learn for or is it a very different topic or how, how many parallels do you see with regards to what you're doing in classic aviation that's a great question i mean uh we we definitely have to uh learn a lot from classical aviation i mean it has this uh, unprecedented safety record so uh, let's not ignore what worked over decades um, but on the other hand, we see a lot of potential, what to optimize, what to change. And I think there couldn't be a better timing uh, than now to, to address this. So um, it's a much broader scope, actually. And it's not just about air taxes, it's uh, to start with drones and air taxes to modernize aviation as we know it. So this is a key driver and this is uh, helping everyone at the end. So that in the best case, classic aviation will be uh, refurbished. Uh, if I may formulate it that uh, that way. Thank you. Maybe, maybe so, I can uh, yeah. one that uh, I, at least in the Western world, we observe a strong development into uh, towards more individualized traveling. And urban air mobility is really a big, big uh, asset uh, for that. And um, I think uh, urban air mobility will set new standards for mobility in terms of individualization. And um, I think we should be strong enough to really differentiate between classical commercial aviation and its operational environment, especially the um, ANSP, the air traffic management uh, topic. And we should carefully look at the micro cosmos of urban air mobility to set up appropriate, flexible uh, guidance and control systems for this individual new mobility system. Because otherwise we will not uh, take all the advantages of uh, this uh, urban air mobility technologies. Yeah, very good point. Thank you so much. We are out of time, unfortunately. It was very interesting and for me it flew by at least, um, I guess for uh, our listeners as well. Um, I just wanted to take a couple of seconds to talk about the events that Lufthansa Systems and our team here um, are putting together. We would love it if our speakers would come back um, and join us again for some of these. Um, we're gonna also be adding other speakers and we already have confirmed some, but we have um, an event what we're working on about setting up vendors for autonomous flight to make sure that the operations and the uh, aircraft themselves are safe as well as the IT to support them. Um, how to maintain the new fleet of, um, of drones, passenger cargo with regards to um, MRO concepts and things like that and the underlying technology how to divide and secure the new airspace which I think is a very um, contentious topic when you talk to classic aviation and this is something where we would like to get into uh, really a nice debate about this so some of you definitely would like to come back for that um, a new landscape for urban ground and air flight operations so what does a what does the operation look like is it very similar to a classical aviation what are the things that need to change what are the te technologies that um, uh, need to be adapted or developed from scratch who will be the first to make money? What is the commercialization plan? Um, which country is going to be first to, to start making money? Um, and I think that this is a very interesting uh, discussion and definitely would like Felix to come back and give the Chinese per uh, perception for that one, um, if possible, as well as some others. And then the sustainability angle about um, urban air mobility this is all electric all of the technology that we're talking about so um what are the advantages and and maybe also move into different types of um clean fuels and things like that just going a little bit more into classic aviation but um, i think also very interesting for the audience that we have here thank you very much to all of you um we have the linkedin qr codes for all of the speakers um as for myself, please get in touch if you have any questions uh, for me or uh, for Lufthansa Systems or for colleagues uh, from the Lufthansa Group. Um, get in touch, um, even if it's just for a chat. And um, 
Thank you once again to all of the speakers. You pulled um, a wonderful uh, set of uh, presentations, um, and I think we all learned a lot and also drew a very, very high quality listening crowd, uh, which I would like to thank you for again. And um, absolutely a pleasure to, to host you here, and thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thanks Thank so you. Bye bye. Bye bye.